Hi, Pastor Anthony here. At Vintage Faith Church, we stand behind the Bible's claim to be the Word of God, and we believe that the Scriptures contain everything needed for life and godliness. The Scriptures testify to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that this recording stirs your faith towards that end. This is in no way meant to be a substitute for the local church gathering, which we believe is critical to your growth as a Christian and your walk with Christ. We pray that you will find the sermon edifying and challenging. Thank you for listening. How would you say you respond to correction and warnings? That's the question that I want to get kind of moving in your minds and your your hearts as you listen to the text today. Over the course of your life, for those who are older, how have you responded to correction and warnings? Can you think back to times where you just despised it and hated the person who gave you the correction or the warning? Maybe there's times that you can think back to at the time that you heard the correction and warning, you despised it, but then as you grew and as your life progressed, you can look back and say, thank you that that person said that to me. In 1992, author Michael Horton interviewed the infamous Dr. Schuler. Dr. Schuler was the founder of and preacher of the Crystal Cathedral. Many of you are aware of what that is. Um, He was the pioneer of the seeker-sensitive church movement. Uh, This movement sought to take away words like sin, repentance, judgment, wrath, and only focus on the the love of God, and, and, and it combined a lot of motivational speaking with the Bible. And Horton interviewed Schuller with this in mind, because he wanted to understand, hey, what's going on here at at, at the Crystal Cathedral? So he had him on for an interview, and Dr. Schuller graciously agreed to interview. And I just want to read a little of that transcript. Horton says, Dr. Schuller, how could you write, sanctify the ego trip, And make us proud in light of passages that say, I hate pride and arrogance, Proverbs 8.13. Pride goes before destruction, Proverbs 16.18. The Lord detests all the proud, Proverbs 16.5. Do not be proud, Romans 12.16. Love does not boast, it is not proud, 1 Corinthians 13.4. In fact, Paul warns Timothy that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. 2 Timothy 3.2. Why should we, again, this is Horton asking Schuler, why should we as Christian ministers, why should we do anything to encourage people to become lovers of themselves? If indeed Paul warned others that this would be the state of godlessness in the last days. Days. Schuler then responds, I hope you don't preach this. I hope you don't preach this. Horton responds, Preach what? The text? Because he just quoted the Bible. Schuler responds, No, what you just spoke into the microphone right now, I hope you don't because you could do a lot of damage to a lot of beautiful people. And I open up this sermon with that interview because I know that some of you lean in that direction. You might sympathize with Dr. Schuler. You may know his ministry. You may not know his ministry. But you you may think and, and wish, Pastor, I just wish you would encourage us on Sunday. I just wish you would just tell us that God loves us. But brothers and sisters, that is not the whole counsel of God. It isn't the whole counsel of God. That is why we preach through books of the Bible, because it forces us to grapple with a text like we're going to grapple with today. 
I can remember a day when the Valentine family uh, was on a hike, and, and, and I think this was Chittenango Falls, but it might have been somewhere else. I don't exactly remember, and I had asked Amy where, where this was, and she didn't remember either. And we were hiking, and the kids were little. Probably three to eight in that, in that range, and I don't know if that math works out. Um, but I remember Ella, and I asked her if I could share this. She, she told me yes. Um, we, there was a cliff, and, and there was a railing on the side of the cliff, and Ella jumped over the railing. And she was hit like this on the railing towards the cliff. Now, I'm sure she's going to remember that in a way where, oh, you guys are overreacting, and it wasn't that bad, but there was a cliff. She would have tumbled down um, that cliff and it would not have been good. And, and when Amy and I saw that, we both jumped and, and, and just shouted, and wh who knows what came out of our mouths. And, and it, was, it was a warning. Like, Ella, get back. You can't do that. You could slip. The, the, the railing might not be strong. It, it, who knows what could happen? It's dangerous. And I know nobody in here would disagree with that warning. We all know that it is a loving thing for a parent to warn their child of a physical danger. Don't run out in the road. There could be a car coming. Don't walk on that ice. It could be thin and you could fall through. Um, there's, don't hang off the side of a cliff. But shouldn't we take spiritual warnings at least, at least the same, and if not more, than a physical warning. And that's where I know not everyone agrees with me. And I would just encourage you this morning to think it through. Are there stakes, like high stakes, in your walk with the Lord? Are there high stakes in walking away from the Lord and rejecting Christ. And the author of Hebrews is going to say yes to that this morning, and we're going to see that. C.S. Lewis has a quote, and there's a few of them here I'm taking from two different sources. But he says, every age, not age like how old you are, but age, like we live in 2024, every age has its own outlook it is especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain mistakes. From seeing this, one passes to the realization that our own age is also a, a period, so it's a period of time, and certainly has, like all periods, its own characteristic illusions. They are likeliest to lurk in those widespread assumptions which are so ingrained in the age that no one dares to attack or feels it necessary to defend them. Could it be, could it be that, that this age that we are all living in, this age of self-esteem, the whole self-esteem movement, the age of Every child competes and gets a trophy. There's no winners or losers. We're not even going to keep score, by the way. We're going to play a game, but we're not going to keep score. Could it be that some of the thinking that is characteristic of the age we live in has seeped into the church? And the church is doing the same thing, trying to take some of the warnings and the, the tough language in Scripture and just, nah, let's sweep that over here. That's going to hurt people, like Schuler says. That's going to damage people. But here's what I would challenge you. If you're siding with Schuler, and I say siding, if you're sympathetic, and I know that that's, that's, that's got to be the case that some of you are, if you're sympathetic to Schuler, then what do you do with the fact that the Bible is the Word of God? It's the breathed out Word of God. When Paul says, I didn't shrink back from giving you the whole counsel of God. This is what he's talking about. 
He's saying, I'm not just saying that God loves you and that he's got a plan for your life. I'm saying that there's danger too if you reject him and that you're a sinner and that you need him and that there's wrath and there's justice and there's, there's consequence for rejecting God or living outside of his will that he has made clear for all believers. It's only happened a few times in my own life. But as I was preparing the sermon, I was thinking about times in my life where I've been confronted with, with God's word from somebody else. Um, I would take two of those times and say they were major turning points in my faith. And praise the Lord that somebody was bold enough to say, hey, you're doing this, but the scriptures say this, and they're not in line. I hated it when it happened. I was angry when it happened. I was mad at the person who said it. But Down the road, I can look back and say, praise God that somebody was willing to say, this is what the scriptures say, live like it. Because the words of God are the words of life. The words of God are the words of life. Today, again, we have another major warning passage in the book of Hebrews. There's one more after this. I pray that you can hear it. It might not be for you. But in a sense, all the warning passages are for all of us. They, they, they get us back on and thinking, okay, this is serious. Like, this is not to be trifled with. This is not something like, hey, it would be nice if you believed in God. This is life or death, spiritual life or death. So I, I pray that you can hear. All right, with that said, let's look at our text today. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think? will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God? And how you answer that question is most likely going to answer how you respond to a warning passage like we have today in in the Bible. Uh, The words go on and deliberately here are, are significant. Every one of you and me All believers will sin. So in a sense, all of us, because we're fallen human creatures, go on sinning. But the the words that the author here is, is, is focusing on is go on, which is continual, and deliberately, which means I don't care what God says. I will do what I want. That's what the author has in view here. That's what he has in mind. This is the idea that that he brought in a few weeks ago or a month ago about high-handed sin. It's all over the Bible. So in in the Old Testament, God had the sacrificial sin uh, system. So when you sin, here is what you do. Blood of bulls, blood of goats, day of atonement. But there were certain sins that God said, hey, if you're doing that, out of the camp. Numbers 15, 30 to 31. 
This is what the author of Hebrews, I believe, is talking about. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord. That person shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be on him. So this this is an Old Testament idea and and it goes right into the new. This is what Paul means when he says, if you're doing these things, if you're in sexual immorality or you're, you're doing this, that, that you have nothing but the judgment facing you. This is, again, this is New Testament. This is not just Old Testament. There is a high-handed way that, that a Christian, and I put it in quotes, thinking they're a Christian, can act and be where, where the Bible just does not allow that. Sure, you can, you can wander. Sure, you can be in the desert, but, but God's people will persevere. They will come back. They will repent. A Christian is not a Christian because they don't sin. A Christian is a Christian because they know what to do when they do. Christians repent. Non-Christians are going to justify their sin. I did this because of this, because of that person. But Christians repent. This is the gospel. It's the heart of the gospel. In fact, uh, Jesus tells a parable, and, and, and it's come into this series more than once, of the Pharisee and the tax collector. They both go to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee, who is trusting in his own righteousness, he's praying, and he says, thank God I'm not like other men. And he says, I fast, and I tithe, and I do this, and I do that. It's pure legalism. But the tax collector, in Luke 18, 13 to 14, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus goes on to say, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. That is made right. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is repentance, and this is what it means to be a Christian. Often you, you'll hear the unbelieving or, or maybe well-meaning misguided Christians say, well, what about King David? What about David? What about David? He, he committed adultery. He had a man murdered. David did some horrible things. He's probably got you all beat in the sin category. And, and people will say, well, well, what about David? Doesn't that mean that we're, we're all okay? But, but here's what is missing. David repented. You can read it in the Psalms. He repented in grief. He begged God. He, he cried out to God, forgive me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David repented. So the author here is saying, if we just go on sinning in deliberate sin, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, after we've heard the gospel, after we've been in church, after we've professed belief, after all of this, we we say we're a Christian, but yet we live any old way. He's saying, there's nothing left for you. This is harsh, right? This This is a warning. He's saying, there's nothing left but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. We need to take these warnings and and remember them, and and they're loving. When I warned my daughter not to hang off the side of a cliff, I wasn't warning her out of a judgmental spirit. I wasn't hurting her It is what she needed to hear because she was in the face of danger. 
And that is what the author of Hebrews is doing to, to anyone that's listening, is saying you could be, you could be in the face of danger, turn, turn, turn back to God. To reject Christ in, in the sacrifice of Christ is to say that he died for nothing. To reject Christ is to say that he died for nothing. Michael Kruger sa says it this way. He says, think about all the blessings and privileges a person has enjoyed who has been part of the church and professed to be a Christian. They have the truth of God's word preached to them. They have the fellowship of the Christians. We're going to see that today. Beautiful fellowship. We're going to eat together. They enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is moving when we gather. And whether you're a believer or not, you're going to sense that. That's going to be sensed. They enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit in that community even if not in them personally. And yet in the end, some still reject Christ. And this is, again, this is what the author of Hebrews is talking about. You've been in the covenant community. You've been under the preaching of the word. You've gone from the shadow to the substance. And now you're looking at going back. Don't go back. Don't do it. As I worked through the text this week, I, I couldn't help but seeing a connection to, to the end of Chris's sermon about the gathering, because his last verse was about the gathering, and the first verse today is about deliberate sin. Let me read the, the last couple verses from Chris's sermon last week. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So Chris did a great job unpacking that. And, and as I looked at, at the end of his sermon and this and, and started seeing a connection and started reading what other theologians were saying, there was all a connection to the gathering. Part of this deliberate sin is saying, I don't need the gathering at all. That's part of it. It's not just that, but that it's included. Al Mohler says it like this of the people who have neglected. And by the way, that word neglect means cease, stop, forsake. So, so the idea behind neglecting the gathering is they're done. They're not coming back. They're, they're done meeting with God's people. And, and, and Moeller has some good words here. He says, in, instead of aligning with God's people, the church, they have chosen to identify with his adversaries. The judgment here refers to the final judgment when God will condemn all of his enemies once and for all. So just a, a small note back to the gathering. When, when we meet here on Sunday, you are aligning with God's people. When you're part of a church, you are aligning with what the Bible would call the seed of the woman. And when you say, I don't need it, I'm out, I don't need a church, I'm going to do this thing on my own, you're actually placing yourself outside of his people and aligning with the seed of the serpent. And that's what Moeller is saying here. And he's saying, if you've, if you've heard all these beautiful, glorious gospel truths and, and walked away and, or, or in some kind of grievous sin that you're not repenting on, you have trampled underfoot the Son of God. Trampled. This is a, a harsh indictment. Trampled underfoot Jesus is what the author is saying. And then he goes on to say, you've profaned. We all know what profanity is here. You've profaned the blood of the covenant. 
So this author has spent so much time talking about the blood of Jesus and the beauty of the blood of Christ. And he's saying, if you walk away from that and say, I don't need it, you're making the blood profane. What is holy, you are calling common. It's blasphemous. And then finally, he says, you've outraged the spirit of grace. You've outraged the spirit of grace. You, you've taken part. This, again, should make us think back to Hebrews 6, where it's like you drunk in the word, you tasted, but then you walked away. And he's saying you, you've experienced the spirit, and you've walked away. So this is, this is the warning. And God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. And, and I know there's some in here that just don't believe that. You want to believe that that God is only loving and is only always going to accept everyone. You may have a line with Hitler. You may have a line with with evil and say, well, maybe not those people. But, But the truth is that line is a lot closer to you than you know. You're in that line because we're all evil. Romans 3 says, we are all, we have all, no one seeks God. Everyone is turned away. We all need Jesus. There's not just some people that need the sacrifice of Christ. All people need Christ. Amen. Amen. All of us need Christ. All right, so for, for those of you who don't like the warnings, take a big breath. We're going we're gonna to encourage now. Okay, it's gonna, that, that's, that's behind us. I hope you heard what you needed to hear. I, I hope you were encouraged where you needed to be encouraged. But the author is going to pivot here. And there's going to be some encouragement. All right. Verses 32 and on. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. So how do we how do we persevere in the faith? I, I think there's two things in this section. One, he's telling us to look backward, and the other, he's telling us to look forward. I'll start with, with looking backward. The author says, recall the former days when you had so much, I'm going to paraphrase, so much faith that you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. You counted your newfound faith in God as infinitely more worth than any of your possessions or your reputation or even your health or your body or your life. That's what the author is saying. Remember those days. Can you remember back to your early days coming to faith? I know many of your stories, so I've heard those days for you. And I know some of you were swept off of your feet by the love of God. You experienced the grace of God in in a magnificent way where you knew it was like scales fell from your eyes and and where you were blind, then you could see. Not everyone's story is like that, but I know that for some of you. And you would have done anything for the Lord. Anything. Anything. You might have even prayed to God, use me, use me in any way that that you want. But as your faith continued and that seemed to wear off, your zeal wore off. And that happens because God is, he's he's strengthening, strengthening you, he's strengthening me. It's like a little child, a baby, when you're born, you're gonna, that baby's gonna be in the mother's arms. But sooner or later, that baby's walking and then walking on their own. And and that's much like our faith. But the author here is is reminding these these Christians who are 
who are tempted to turn back, who are tempted to forsake the, the gospel. And he's saying, remember those days. Remember those days when the Lord was working so strong in you, none of your possessions mattered, none of the, the earthly um, ambition that you have mattered. All that mattered was Jesus, and, and you knew you had a possession coming that's better than anything you have in this world. Brothers and sisters, I would commend to you to look back, recall your, your former days. Maybe you've never experienced those days. Pray to God that you can experience them. Practically speaking, one of the things that, that Amy and I do is we, we both journal her way more than me, but throughout the year I'm just writing prayers, what's going on, how did God work, and then every year we're just kind of opening those journals in January. Hey, how, how has God worked in my life? Oh, I forgot about that. Do you remember what he did in February? Oh, wow. In, in July. Wow. Because we forget. We forget that, that he's moving. In the Old Testament, God would tell Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when, when God moved, he would say, build an altar. Put stones in that place and remember for every generation that God moved in that place. This is how God wants us as believers to operate. Because we forget. I mean, think about the people of Israel. The, the Red Sea is parted. God is moved with a pillar of fire by night and smoke by day. And three days after they're on the other side of the Red Sea, they're grumbling and complaining. That's us if we're honest. So look back and look back often. One of the ways in which God has set up for us to look back is baptism. Chris touched on it last week. Baptism into the covenant community, believer's baptism, is a way for us to remember, I, may, I put my flag in the ground or my stake in the ground on that day, no matter how hard that was, and I'm saying I am the Lord's. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to live for the Lord. And any of you who have been baptized, you know that, that up to baptism, there's going to be a wrestle and a struggle and, and you're going you're gonna to have thoughts of your flesh is going to get in there. Why am I doing this? This is crazy. And in and, and all of that, God is using baptism to purify your faith. So one of the ways that we look back is remember your baptism. Remember when you stood in front of the many witnesses and professed faith. So if you haven't been baptized, we're, we're looking at having another baptism service here in, in, in the upcoming months. See, see myself or see Steve. But baptism is an altar. It's a way to look back. But the author here is also calling us to look forward. And he says, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. What caused them? What gave them the strength to do what they did? What gives you the strength to live as a believer, to make decisions to follow God, to deny your flesh, to, to stand up and maybe do something that God's calling you to do that you could look foolish if you fail? God calls us to pick up our cross and follow him, to deny our flesh, and, and what motivated them and what's going to motivate you to do that is to look forward. To look forward. To the possession that, that, that you can, by faith, to, to what God has for you and me. Hebrews eleven sixteen. we're going to get into the, the entire chapter of 11. is all about, the, it's the faith chapter. I'm sure many of you are aware of it. It's all rooted in, in the passage we're in today. It's all rooted in, in this passage, but Hebrews eleven sixteen. But as it is, they, this is all the saints that the writer is, is commending, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Friends, 
There is an inheritance for Christians. If you reject Christ, there is no inheritance. There is an inheritance for Christians. Call it a better country. Call it a heavenly country. It's the new heavens and the new earth. And often, what we do, and what I know many of us struggle with, is we, we want what is going to be ours one day, and we want it now. In this world, which the Bible says this world were sojourners, exiles, and aliens. The Bible says this world is not our home. But some of you are just way too cozy with this world. You know that the Bible says that you're, we're to be sojourners. You know that the Bible says that we're exiles. But you want comfort and you want comfort now. And you want to feel that full experience of everything that you want that can't be given to you in this world. And you want it now. We wonder why we're often miserable because we have expectations up here and the reality is this world has fallen and you have to, you have to remember there's going to be suffering. Your body's going to break down. People are going to sin against you. You're going to sin against people. This world, what the Puritans would call it, misery. Now they might have been a little off on that, a little too much leaning into that, but there is an element of this world is pure misery that we've forgotten today. We want to make it our home. And some of you are just too comfortable living in sin. And you're Christians. You have the Holy Spirit. And you're living in sin and, and you know it. For you, you need to see that God is greater than sin. Whatever that fleshly desire that you think you need, God is better. And that's what these Christians are being exhorted to. You knew yourselves you had a better possession. They were willing to lose everything. Reputation, jobs, property, lives. They joyfully accepted this. Because they knew they had a better possession. And if we're living in that deliberate sin that the author was just talking about, we can't be these people that he's talking about here. You can't be both. You're going to either fall into one category, I'm living in deliberate sin, or I am living with the hope of the gospel, the better possession, and obedient. Of course, none of us are going to be living that perfectly. Hebrews 11, it talks about Moses and says, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. The pleasures of sin are fleeting. They're fleeting. They might feel good, taste good, whatever, for a moment. But it's always going to drag you down and drag you away from God. Christian, you have a better possession. And part of that possession is you can live with fruit and joy in your life now. It's, it, it is about the future hope, but that future hope will bear down on your life now. And we all know this is true. Just think of people that you know that are in some kind of grievous sin, and you know that sin destroys. You know that. But what about when you're flirting with, with sin? You might think you have it on a leash. I've got this under control problem is sin has a, an appetite that just never ends. And, and maybe it's a little tiger now, but that's going to turn into a full-grown male tiger who will devour you. So repent and turn and believe in the better possession. 
Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Do you know? Do you know what that reward is? Do you know when Paul says the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, do you know what he's talking about? Have you you read through at least the New Testament to know what that that hope of glory means? Because if we we don't know what the, the hope is, we have no shot at living for it. If you don't know what that hope is, we, how do we know, how, how is it going to do what the writer is saying here, that it was a better possession and they were willing to lose things for this reward? We have to know what that reward is, and, and we don't have time to, to really unpack that, but here's what I want to just quickly say. Our resurrection. Are you sick? Are you tired? Did your body hurt? You're going to have a resurrected body, a strong body. Is your sight going? You're going to have perfect sight. Are you anxious? There's going to be no more anxiety. Are you fearful? Fear is going to be gone. Amen. Is work toil for you? That will still be work, but it won't be toil. The new heavens and the new earth are described as a marriage with Jesus as the groom and his church as the bride, and heaven is going to descend to earth. That's what the Bible says. Heaven is going to come down from heaven to earth. And at that moment, it's it's called a marriage. There's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb, and there's going to be the feasts of all feasts. And you're going to be in your resurrected body, And we're going to be sitting around, who knows, but it it appears to be some kind of table or tables or something, eating and feasting and kicking off the new heavens and the new earth. No more tears, no more death, no more pain. Life so full, you'll be content all the time. Ever learning, ever exploring, ever playing, even working. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will will be with them as their God. God will walk with us. Amen. This This is the hope. This is the abiding possession. This is the inheritance. And it's so much more than this. But Lewis, C.S. Lewis says this of it. He says, we are half-hearted creatures fooling around, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Brothers and sisters, what are your mud pies? What is your slum? Think about that today. What are your mud pies? What is your sin? What's your slum? Where are you going to play play in that sin? What are your mud pies? Where is your slum? Often when we're playing in whatever we're playing in, think about a children playing in mud. They come in the house half the time. They don't know that they got mud all over them. Right? They they might think they're clean, but everyone can see that they're playing in mud. Often when we're in sin, it's the same thing. We think that we're fooling people around us. We think we're fooling God, but we're fooling nobody. God is offering the holiday at sea. And we often choose the mud pies in the slum. All right. Let's wrap this up with verses 36 and on. For you have need of endurance... So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we, brothers and sisters, this is take courage here. We 
are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. That is who we are. So if you're hearing this warning all, all morning and you're, you're like, ah, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't like this, well, may, maybe you're just 1039. You are, you, hey, you're not shrinking back. You're living this life of faith. But maybe you are in the other category and you needed to hear the warning this morning. Just know if you needed to hear it, it's not judgment against you. It could be. It's God's love towards you. It's God's love towards you. His warning, all his warnings are love. And it's up to us when we hear them. How am I going to respond to that? Am I going to respond with faith and repentance or am I going to respond with a high hand and say, I don't care what you said. I don't like the preacher. Maybe blame it on me. I don't care. I'm going to move on and keep doing what I want. That is not us. We are those who do not shrink back. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, oh Lord, we, we often struggle with this. In some sense, all of us have our moments where we shrink and we confess that. We pray for faith. We pray for boldness. Lord, show us where repentance and obedience give life. I know there's some in here that just are believing the lie from, from the devil who says that, that that's taking from them, but it's not, it's life. And I pray that even today that some can experience the life and the, the, the flourishing and the blessing of repentance and obedience. Lord, stir us up by the hope that you've given us in what is to come. I pray that that hope bears down on our lives right now today and stirs us up and that we can encourage one another because we know that what is coming for all of us is so glorious, so weighty that we can't even really describe it. So we love you, Lord, and we thank you. And we just pray as we sing these last two songs that you unite our, our minds and our hearts together as a body as we eat together today. Um, just give us joy. Give us uh, the sweet joy that comes from the body of Christ and, and fellowship. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in with us. We hope that you found this sermon edifying, encouraging, and challenging. To learn more about Vintage Faith Church, visit VintageFaithCicero.com. And of course, if you live in the area, we invite you to worship the Lord with us on Sunday mornings.